word of God is found in the gospel according to Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 46, concluding at verse 50. I'll be reading the message translation. I encourage you to follow along in whatever version you may have. The next day they found him, that is Jesus, in the temple seated among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. The teachers were all quite taken with him, impressed with the sharpness of his answers. But his parents were not impressed. They were upset and hurt. His mother said, young man, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been half out of our minds looking for you. He said, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know that I had to be here dealing with the things of my father? The King James says, didn't you know I must be about my father's business? But they had no idea what he was talking about. You may be seated in God's house, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God for his word. I'd like to tag this particular text and message as we continue our series of preaching entitled, Go Be Great. I'd like to tag this particular text and message with the title, From Good to Greater. From Good to Greater. At the beginning of this year, I preached a sermon entitled, From Great to Greater Works, that looked at how to handle the in-between place between God's promises and your present situation. We discussed the weight David had to become king of Israel. He was anointed, but did not take office for many years. Today, however, we want to look at how we move beyond those boundaries to go from being good and trying to do good to the greater that Jesus tells us we will do. Jim Collins, about 20 years ago, wrote a book entitled Good to Great. I'm, some, I'm sure some of you are familiar with it. In the book, he talked about how the transition from good to great, the movement to change and transform, does not have to be painful or gut-wrenching. Places and organizations and people that go from good to great don't have a program in place. They don't rant about crises that come in their midst. They don't bicker about the past. They don't have to motivate people. Their people are self-motivated to engage the mission. Money does not motivate them. Fear does not drive change. Fear does not stop change. But what they all have in common is an earnest commitment, a sincere dedication to do the work that they are commissioned to do and to be the people they are designed to be. And the truth is that on this journey from good to greater, you want your faith, your covenant community to understand that in God, we have no limits and no limitations. Sometimes we limit ourselves because of the boxes we put ourselves in. If you are conditioned to only go as far as your box allows, then you will never reach greater that God has promised to you. And once you are conditioned and comfortable in your box, then your box is as far as you're willing to go. And the subtle truth of humanity is that many of us don't realize that we have grand and extraordinary greatness that is coursing through our veins. Uh, we have placed these boxes and boundaries on who we are and what we are capable of doing. Boundaries on how high we can aim and on how far we can reach. Boundaries on where we can go and how much we can grow. And the truth is that today the church cannot simply rely on doing good. These times that we live in now call for us to trust God that we can do and be greater. We must move today from good to greater. One of the most disingenuous people in the world is not the person who does not believe they have any greatness, but it is the person who knows that they have the potential to do great things. Who knows that they can stand up against unrighteousness? Who knows they have the potential to change inconsistency, to stand up for kindness, to change hearts about this faith and our future? But they choose to do nothing, to say nothing, and to stand for nothing. The person who knows better and still chooses to stand by and watch others be victimized and bullied is a dangerous somebody because their moral compass only points in a self-serving direction. 
Dr. King suggested in his letter from a Birmingham jail, he said that the Ku Klux Klan and the Nazi groups were not the greatest threat to fully achieving universal solidarity. He said, but progress and our potential was stifled by white moderates, and I would add all moderates who prefer order to true justice and freedom. They believe in the potential for solidarity, believe in the potential for equality. They believe in the potential of the idea that we are all God's children, but do not want to sacrifice any of their negative peace, which is the absence of tension so we all can experience God's peace, uh, which is the presence of justice. They say there is potential in the goal you seek, Dr. King said, but I don't agree that this is the right time. Uh, and we are comfortable and complacent with our potential, satisfied with being a tail light in our society. As the church following the status quo, going along just to get along in the church and allowing the gates of hell to infiltrate God's church instead of the church being a headlight leading men and women, boys and girls, to higher levels of service, sacrifice, and unity. We have been locked for too long in the cavernous cocoon of good, and God wants us to be greater. There are also those who believe that great is something for somebody else. They would tell you that my great is only as large as the fence around my current conditions. Great is for somebody else, somebody younger, somebody older, somebody smarter than me, somebody with more connections than I have, somebody who has more stuff than I got. I used to have it when I was an infant, but now I'm too past my prime to re recapture any greatness. We resign ourselves to believing that great is not for me. I am what I currently am. There is no more that I can do or can be. I had great when I was younger. I had it when I was more energetic. I had it when I was new to the faith. I had it when I I was a little child. I had it before I got married. I had it before I had children. I had it before, but I don't know how much great I got left in me right now. Uh, this limited view of greatness is not only for those whose hairs have turned gray and eyes have grown dim, but we've got young folk still in the sunrise of life who have resolved that they ain't got no great inside of them. Uh, there is no great where I grew up. No great because of my environment. No great for my academic progress. No great for me to do anything of value. Great is for the folk that start above the scratch line. Great is for the rich and the famous. Great is only for folk who have advantages. I can only go so far. I can only do so much. I can only learn so much. Stop worrying me about being great. The flip side, however, is that some of us are limited by the fact that people told us a long time ago we were great. Sometimes good cripples us because it can promote complacency. As long as I'm good, I've been told I'm good, I'm great, I've got something even though it's not all I can be, I can still take pride in the fact that I'm good. Children committing suicide today at an alarming rate, they need more from us than good. The victims of domestic violence and abuse, they need more from us than good. The babies that are dying because of infant mortality here in the city of Cleveland, they need more from us than good. Separated families at the border, separated families in our communities, they need more from us than good. Good has messed some folk up in the world. Good is why some folk have yet to grow up. Good tricks you into believing that you've got tomorrow to be great. Tomorrow is an opportunity to do better, to do more. Tomorrow is an opportunity to make some stuff happen. If I'm preaching to some honest folk, uh, you would agree with me that we got some precautions procrastinators in here today. You've been putting some stuff off, been casting it aside, been waiting for some tomorrow, some other day, some other chance that may never show up. Somebody shout greater, greater, greater. You got to do greater. All of us, all of us can be greater. We have potential to go from good to great, to be creative, to be servant leaders, to be witnesses, to be fearless, to be faithful, to be exactly who God says we are. But God is searching for some folk who aren't content with just doing good. You can be greater because you already got goodness and mercy following your life. You got love lifting you and you got the Holy Spirit inside of you. God demands that you and I be greater. God is looking for some people who aren't scared to take some risks, some folk who seek God for greater works because the fact is that good is good, but God's powerful, profound, and prodigious greatness is so much better. You can't park on good lane, but, but you got to move over to greater way. We got to get up off our blessed quietness and holy quietnesses and do the work of the Lord together. There is this stat in football. There's a stat in football called yak. 
It's YAC. They stand for something. And YAC stands for yards after catch. The quarterback has done the job of getting the ball to the receiver. Sam Craig has run. He ran a 15-yard out. His knees held up, and he ran that 15-yard out. He ran it, and he's right by the out-of-bounds out line. And, and, and the quarterback throws him the ball. And, and guess what? The yards after catch means that when he catches it, he doesn't just go out of bounds. But he's able to move another 5, 10, 1 yard. He's able to get us one more one more yard, one more yard, that's yards after the catch. The receiver makes up their mind that when I catch this, I got to do everything I can to keep moving forward. I cannot be content with just catching the ball where I am. The quarterback has done this job, and the receiver's got two jobs. The receiver got to catch it and then got to make the most out of it that they can make. Harriet Tubman, W.E.B. Du Bois, Granville T. Woods, Frederick Douglass, and Martin King, our church mothers, our church fathers here at Antioch, they all went back to pass and they passed us the ball and here we are decades later and they're still waiting on us to catch it and keep running forward we got to do greater they built look at what they did they built schools they opened banks they built businesses with no money but they knew little becomes much in the hands of almighty god and all we do is complain about what we don't have and what we can't do and where we can't go god says i demand greater we got greater opportunities but we are not doing greater works we weren't created to just live with good we weren't created to be just rudimentary some of you some of you 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 started teaching a long time ago some of you some of you I, I my mama told me when she started teaching I think her first salary was like twelve hundred dollars for the year not a month, for the year. And I, I remember how, well, I wasn't born then, but came along a little later. My sisters remember, remember how, because they old. They remember how. I said that because they're not here. They're not here. Don't tell them when they come. They, 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 they're old. They, they, they remember that $1,200 being able to do so much. To, to, do, to do so much, to stretch that. We, we weren't created to just live with good. We weren't created to just be ordinary and rudimentary. We weren't created to be comfortable with complacency or to be average or regular. But we were created to make manifest the glory of our God. We were created to make disciples of Christ. We were created to shine as bright lights in a dark world. That's why God gave you power and love and a sound mind. It wasn't so you could be average. You don't need God's power or love or a sound mind just to be average it wasn't so you could just be happy with being good but God did it so we could do great things in the kingdom of God you're looking but not listening let me see if I can unpack it this way Dion Sanders primetime Dion primetime Sanders he was back in the day he was an outfielder for the Atlanta Braves and a cornerback for the Atlanta Falcons at the same time he's the only athlete to hit a major league home run and score an NFL touchdown in the same week Sanders grew up on the mean streets of Fort Myers, Florida, where exposure to some would-be athletes spurred him to make a success of himself. He tells, he tells it like this. He said, I call all those guys that I grew up with who were faster than me, who were bigger than me. He said, I call them Idas, 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 I-D-A apostrophe S. If I'd have done this, if I'd be making three million like you, if I'd have practiced a little harder, I'd be a superstar. They were as fast as him when they were kids, but instead of working for their dreams, they chose drugs and a life of street corners. When he was young, he realized that he had to do something to make sure he did not waste his goodness. Huh? He had to practice. So, And so my advice to folk is that if you don't just want to be good, but if you want to be great, then you got to do practice. Huh? And God is just trying to tell you today that you weren't supposed to just think great thoughts. Huh? You weren't meant to just think great things. Huh? You weren't meant to just have all of this power and potential bottled up inside of your life, huh? but you were meant to do great 
greater works. Uh, the way potential and good turns into greatness is if you dedicate yourself to doing something. Uh, I dropped this on you before, but you ought to do something and your gifts, your greatness will make room for you. Uh, do something that helps your neighbor. Do something that lifts up the laws. Uh, do something that advances Jesus' cause. Uh, do something that raises the standard. Do something that's extraordinary. Do something that defies the odds. Uh, do something not just in church, uh, not just through church, uh, but do something with your family uh, that promotes integrity. Uh, do something at your job uh, that promotes peace. Uh, do something with excellence. Uh, do something that serves. Uh, do something that challenges. Uh, do something that said that you can't do. Uh, you are somebody uh, and you're called to do something. Uh, let me remind you uh, that if there's a life, you can live it. Uh, there's a problem, you can solve it. Uh, there's a cancer, we can cure it. Uh, there's a racism, we can end it. Uh, there's an addiction, we can break it. Uh, there's a mountain, we can move it. Uh, there's a battle, we can fight it. Uh, there's a child, we can raise them. Uh, there's a book, you can write it. Uh, there's a class, you can teach it. Uh, there's a song, you can sing it. Uh, there's a gospel, we can preach it. Uh, there's a business, we can build it. Uh, there's a church, we can join it. Uh, there's a presidency, we can win it. Uh, there's a death, you can delay it. Uh, there's a hell, we can miss it. Uh, there's a heaven, we can get to it. Uh, we can do all things through Christ. Who gives us strength? Gotta, gotta do. Greater works. Jesus in the text has decided that it's time for him to move to greater in his earthly ministry. His parents bring him to attend the annual family reunion called the Feast of the Passover. Celebrated through their cultural and religious identity and they lose contact with their 12-year-old son, Jesus. The first place they look is with his cousin and them. But he ain't with Joseph or Mary's people. He not with either of them. So they start to get worried. They go back to the last place they saw him in Jerusalem. And they look for him and are unsuccessful uh, uh, until the third day. I, I could park there and preach and close the message about, about the third day. We could stay there all day and unpack that. But let me, let me keep pushing. That's not this message today. The third day, they find their 12-year-old son in the temple listening to the teachers and asking questions that were beyond his 12-year-old imagination. They find him there, and before they can respond, Jesus must have seen the look on his mama's face. The look of extreme anxiety and sincere relief of the look of mixed emotions on his mama's face and listens to the worry and trembling in his mama's voice and he speaks to their worry by saying, no worries, no worries, mama and daddy. Didn't you realize that I've got to be about my father's business? Jesus simply is telling mom and daddy, mom and daddy, it's time for me to go from good to greater. It's time for me to start doing the work I was sent to do. Time for me to take all of this knowledge, these skills, this insight, and put it to use for the greater good. It's time for me to be who the Father already says I am. I must be about my Father's business. Uh, and, and I want to park there parenthetically as Jesus' response and his understanding of his own greatness pushes me to ask the text a question. How do I go from good to greater works? Jesus gives us three answers. I promise you, three answers in the text, and I'll be seated. You first go from good to greater works by being devoted to learning. You gotta be devoted to learning. Stay with me. What tremendous devotion it took Jesus to be glued to the temple teachers. This is Jesus. You do know this is Jesus we're talking about. And Jesus took the time to learn from somebody else. Took the time to be in Bible study. Took the time to come to Sunday school. He, he took the time. He took the time to open the book and listen to somebody else that God had called, proclaimed the goodness in the book. And, and guess what? We, he took the time. This is Jesus. Again, this is Jesus now. Why do you think you ain't got to take the time? Why, why would you think that you don't need any investment in your own spiritual growth and development? What devotion it took for Jesus to listen, to learn, to soak in everything he could about the word of God. It, it takes devotion to ask the right questions, to hang out with folk who got something of value to offer to you in the kingdom. Devotion to be motivated. And Jesus shows you that you can't get good, you can't get greatness uh, without devotion. Uh, and there's a word in here for somebody who feel like you can't learn anymore. Maybe you think you know everything there is to be known who feel like school ain't for you uh, and, and Bible study ain't for you uh, and you got other stuff that's more important to you than to learning about the word of the God, of God uh, who feels like you can't go back to college, you can't learn anymore in church, uh, who think preachers, who think preachers can't, can't teach you anything or tell you anything that you don't already know. Folk who devalue the power of Christian education. Jesus, yes, Jesus uh, was in the temple listening uh, 
and asking questions. Uh, that takes devotion. If you're going to make your goodness turn into greatness, uh, then you're going to need some devotion to learning what God wants you to learn. Uh, when others are sleeping, uh, you ought to be studying. Uh, when folk are slipping, uh, you ought to be on top of your game. Uh, when folk are giving up, uh, you got to be able to go on. You got to be devoted to learning uh, so you can grow in grace. Uh, that there's an athletic apparel company that used to be based in South Florida, and it was called Devotion Motivational Gear. Uh, that this company ha was has designed some they great designed some great T-shirts, uh, self-promoting T-shirts that bear a logo that reads "Devotion makes the difference." Uh, of course, their meaning is that their company is what makes the difference. Uh, but when they display these shirts at races, uh, athletes buy them up like hotcakes because that's why they push themselves to run, bike, or swim every day. Uh, they really believe that it's devotion uh, that makes the difference. And that's all God really wants to tell somebody today in here is that devotion uh, really makes the difference. Uh, do I have any help in here uh, who knows that devotion uh, has made a difference in your life? Uh, are there any devoted folk, folk that pick up this book on a week-to-week -week basis uh, and feed yourself with the word of the God of God? Uh, devotion will keep you rooted in the word of God. Uh, devotion keeps your mind sharp. Uh, devotion keeps you humble before God's throne. Uh, devotion gives you strength uh, for your days. Uh, devotion keeps you in touch with your creator. Uh, devotion makes you a lifelong learner. Uh, devotion makes you strive for better. Uh, devotion gives you faith in the middle of failure. Uh, devotion reminds you that you can't run from God's spirit uh, and you can't hide from the presence of the Lord uh, and that God is always with you. You can go from good to greater uh, by being devoted. Got to be devoted to learning. But secondly, you got to be determined to lean. Got to be devoted to learning. But secondly, you got to be determined to lean, to lean. When Jesus talks in this 49th verse of the text, I hear uh, an, an insistence, a hint of determination. I must be, is what he says. I, I, I am compelled. I got no choice there. I, I don't have any other way. I must be. There's a phrase that's wrought. Is wrought with grand determination and grit. I can almost see little 12-year-old Jesus' face as he says with a divine sense of urgency, I must be. I must be because it is my destiny to make a difference. And Jesus needed determination because he would be met with opposition every step of his journey. So he needed to be determined to lean. He said, I got to be not about foolishness. He didn't say I must be in the temple. I must go to church. But he said, I must be about my father's business. And he understood that he needed this determination because he had to go through the politically connected and tell them that the wages of sin is death. He needed determination because his kinfolk were going to turn their backs on him. He needed determination to stand up to big money and big power and tell them the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. And in order for each of us to get out of our lives, get our lives out of park and get it into drive, we must have with our devotion some determination to lean on our father. You must be determined to be about something that's higher and greater than you are. Determination is simply making up your mind about who and what you really are and what you want to be. You've got to be determined to make sure that the voices of our ancestors, uh, that they never die in our souls. Uh, be determined to keep sharing our story of how God has brought us over. Uh, be determined to raise a new standard of excellence and integrity. Uh, our pulpits are filled with people who are so full of themselves uh, that they can't be full of the Holy Ghost. Uh, our political halls uh, are packed right now uh, with folk with big egos uh, instead of people who are looking to serve uh, and serve with gladness. Uh, so we need to be determined, church. Uh, determined Determination, uh, determined to avoid lying to ourselves. Uh, determined because times uh, will get tight on you every now and then. Uh, you're going to have to study uh, even when the registrar uh, tells you that the check ain't going to go through. Uh, you're going to have to serve uh, when your heart is broken. Uh, you're going to have to tell somebody uh, that God is a way maker uh, even though your house is in foreclosure. Uh, you're going to have to love uh, when somebody has hurt you deeply. Uh, all of that takes determination. Uh, you got to be determined uh, to lean on on the Lord. You, you, some of you remember the children's book. One of my favorites when I was little, The Little Engine That Could. <laughs> little Engine. You, you remember, you remember The Little Engine that could approach the base of that ominous big tall mountain full of doubt and fear. Could he make it up? 
Could he get over the mountain? You know the story. He lit into the side of that mountain crying with determination, I think I can. You, you, you know the story, I think I can. And slowly, the little engine began to scale that mountain inch by inch, his confidence grew. Until finally, his determination caught up with his devotion and he was able to cry out, not only do I think I can, but, but now I know I can. I, I know I can. The truth is that we need some little engine that could believers in the church. Uh, we need some folk whose testimony is, uh, I know God can. Uh, I know God can. Uh, you ought to be determined to say, uh, God is an awesome God. Uh, and the God that I serve uh, can do whatever uh, he wants to, when he wants to, uh, and how he wants to. Uh, why, Pastor? Uh, because your opposition uh, is God's opportunity. Uh, what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, what they called a fire, God called a miracle. What Daniel called a lion's den, God called a five-star hotel. What Jonah called a fish, God called a taxi cab. What you call a challenge, God just calls a chance. What you call a sickness, God calls it a healing. What you call a storm, God calls it your shelter. What you call trouble, God calls victory. So I'm determined, I have decided to lean on the Lord. Because with God, I've always got a chance. So won't you be determined to lean on the Lord? I have decided to lean on Jesus. I am determined to lean on the Lord. Is there anybody here that's going to lean on the Lord? Your strength ain't enough. You got to lean on the Lord. I must be about my father's business. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Lean on the everlasting arms of God. I have a blessed peace with my Lord so near because I'm leaning on the everlasting arms of God. You gotta have devotion to learning. You gotta be determined to lean. But third, and finally, and I'm done for real. I know the preachers lie to you all the time and say I'm done after this. They talk for another hour, but I'm not. I, I, I'm determined. I'm determined to lean. I'm devoted to the Lord. I'm devoted. I'm devoted. Devoted to learning. I'm determined to lean. Third and finally, you got to be a disciple of the Lord. Got to be a disciple of the Lord. Discipleship in the Davidsonian translation is fellowship. It's your dedication to following the path, the plan, and the power of God Almighty. Jesus is in the temple learning and leading, being educated and educating, dedicated to discipleship. Listen then to what he says when confronted about his whereabouts. Again, I must be about my father's business. One of the reasons that many of us stay stuck in the realm of good and never advance to greatness is because our interest is not in the right business. Our interest is in the business we choose. Our interest is in our own business or in your business. More often than not, it's your business more and it's our business, and I got to know your business, so I got something on you just in case you get to know my business. That way, I got something over you so you won't tell my business because you know I know your business. Help me, Jesus. I'm going to preach my way out of that in a second. And the sad truth is that so many so-called Christians, we have distorted God's business. We put our spin on God's business. God's business ain't giving you everything you want. God's business isn't making you judge and jury. God's business is not hate, confusion, or separation. God's business is not divide and conquer. And if that's your business, if your business is worry and revenge, if your business is grudges and victimization, if your business is excuses and antagonism, then I promise you, you'll stay stuck at good. But, but good greatness, discipleship, devotion, determination, start and end with learning to be about the Father's business. His business is lifting the lost. His business is giving sight to the blind. His business is educating all people. His business is loving everybody. His business is giving strength to the weak. His business is giving power to the faint. His business is hope for the hopeless, grace for the guilty, and mercy for the messed up. If you are going to move from good to greater, then you got to be about the Father's business. I'm not through with his business. His business exalts every valley. His business makes low every hill. It makes crooked stuff straight, makes rough places smooth. 
His business will touch your life, uh, lifting up your head uh, and guiding your thinking. Uh, is there anybody here uh, who will declare with Jesus uh, that I must be uh, about my Father's business? Uh, discipleship is learning the business of God. Uh, his business is freedom for the captive, uh, love for your neighbor. Uh, bless them that curse you. Uh, but I get really happy because uh, God's business uh, is saving your soul uh, and making you whole, uh, redeeming your life uh, and setting you free. Uh, his business uh, was sending Jesus uh, through 42 generations. Uh, his business uh, included an old rugged cross uh, and a few nails. Uh, discipleship is learning to be uh, about the Father's business. Uh, you're looking but not listening. Uh, so let's go home like this. Uh, a little fellow was living with his grandmama uh, and the house caught on fire. Uh, the grandmama trying to get upstairs uh, to rescue her grandson. Uh, she died in the flames. Uh, the boy's cries for help uh, were finally answered by a man uh, who had climbed an iron drain pipe uh, and came back down with the boy uh, hanging tightly around his neck. Uh, stay with me, church. Uh, several weeks later, a public hearing uh, was held to determine uh, who would get custody of the child. Uh, a farmer, a teacher, uh, and the town's richest person uh, all gave reasons why they felt uh, they should be given uh, the, to be the boy's new parent. Uh, but as they talked, uh, the young man's eyes remained focused down on the floor. Uh, then a stranger walked to the front uh, and slowly took his hands uh, out of his pockets, uh, revealing severe scars uh, all over his hands. Uh, as the crowd gasped, uh, the boy cried out in recognition. Uh, this was the man uh, who had saved his life. Uh, his hands had been badly burned uh, when he climbed up that hot pipe uh, with a leap. Uh, the boy jumped up in the air, uh, threw his arms around the man's neck uh, and held on for dear life. Uh, the other men silently uh, walked away and left the room, uh, leaving the boy and his rescuer all by themselves. Uh, do you know what solved it? Uh, do you know who got him? Uh, those scarred hands uh, had settled the issue. Uh, and y'all stay with me. Uh, and that's why you can go from good to great uh, because of some scarred hands. Uh, is there anybody here uh, that knows about those scarred hands? Uh, in Jesus, uh, you can move to greatness. Uh, he showed you the way. Uh, his life is matchless. Uh, his goodness is limitless. Uh, his mercy is everlasting. Uh, his love never changes. Uh, his word is enough. Uh, his grace is sufficient. Uh, his reign is righteous. Uh, his yoke is easy. Uh, and his burden is light. Uh, is there anybody here uh, that knows about those hands? Uh, I wish I could describe him to you. Uh, but he's indescribable. Uh, he's inexhaustible. Uh, he's incomprehensible. Uh, he is invincible. Uh, he's irresistible. Uh, I'm trying to tell somebody uh, that the heavens can't contain him. Uh, let alone man can explain him. Uh, you can't get him out of your mind. Uh, you can't get him off of your hands. Uh, he's enduringly strong. Uh, he's entirely sincere. Uh, he's eternally steadfast. Uh, he's immortally graceful. Uh, he's imperially powerful. Uh, is there anybody here uh, that loves my Jesus? Uh, he is merciful. Uh, you can't outlive him uh, and you can't live without him. Uh, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, uh, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Uh, Pilate couldn't find uh, anything wrong with him. Uh, the witnesses couldn't get their testimonies uh, to agree. Uh, Herod couldn't kill him. Uh, death couldn't handle him. Uh, and the grave can't hold him down. Uh, he died on Friday, uh, was dead on Saturday. Uh, but my Bible says uh, that early on Sunday morning, uh, he got up with all power. Uh, his scarred hands uh, had settled the case. Uh, and you can move to greatness because uh, you're saved by the blood. Uh, your rebirth starts because uh, you're saved by the blood. Uh, don't stay stuck on good. Uh, be devoted, determined, uh, and be a disciple uh, that leans on the Lord. I must be. I must be. I must be. I must be about my father's business. And if we are, if we are devoted, if we're determined, if we are disciples of the Lord, we can move from good from just good, good, doing good, being good, to greater works. Jesus said, greater work shall you do, because I'm going to the Father. I must be, you must be, we must be about our Father's business. And if you ever forget why you should be about his business, just remember 
that those scarred hands have settled your case. Those scarred hands have settled your debt. Scarred hands have given you life and given you life abundantly and eternally. Stand with me all over God's house if you're able.